The spike in interest we're seeing in both microservices and containers is all about one thing, speed. With the broad availability now of on-demand elastic cloud infrastructure, every company I talk to is in a race to deliver better software faster. Forrester calls this the age of the customer because every company is now competing to win, serve, and retain customers better. And customer experience is now king. Microservices help developers break up monolithic applications into smaller components. They can move away from all at once massive package deployments and break up applications into smaller individual units that can be deployed separately. Smaller microservices can give applications more scalability, more resiliency, and most importantly, they can be updated, changed, and redeployed faster. Some of the biggest public cloud applications run as microservices already. Containers are a packaging strategy for these microservices. You can think of them more as process containers than virtual machines. They run as a process inside a shared operating system. And a container typically does only one small job, validate a login or return a search result. Docker is a tool that describes those packages in a common format and helps launch and run them. Linux containers have been around for a while, but their popularity in the public cloud has given rise to an exciting new ecosystem of companies that are building tools to make them easier to use, to cluster and orchestrate them, to run them in more places, and to manage their end-to-end -end life cycles. So over the last two years, many different types of software vendors, from operating system to IT infrastructure companies, they've all joined the container ecosystem. And there's already an industry organization, the Open Container Initiative, that's guiding the market and making sure everyone plays well together. IBM and HP, uh, Microsoft and VMware, uh, Google, Red Hat, and CoreOS, those are just some of the major vendors that are now all racing to make containers as easy as possible for developers to use, to share amongst themselves, to protect, and to scale. Yes, enterprises should care about containers and Docker, and the data already shows that they do. So Forrester's most recent developer survey data shows about four to five percent of developers deploy apps into production containers today. That's pretty low production adoption, but it's still strong for a technology no one was talking about two years ago. Roughly 30% of enterprise developers, on the other hand, tell us they are actively exploring containers. And that's a big number this early in the game. That tells me developers are driving enterprise interest. Now, the vast majority of early adopters are companies that are building cloud-native applications. These are the built-to-scale, microservices-based apps that are born in the cloud and designed to run in the cloud. But what we'll see over the next three years is companies also exploring containers for more traditional, stateful applications, like a more traditional enterprise database workload. That's why so many virtualization vendors, storage vendors, network software companies, and, and even public cloud providers are rushing to create services to help enterprises safely run more and more types of applications in containers. You can think of this trend like a previous one about 10 years ago. That's when server virtualization started to get really popular. First, developers figured out how great virtualization was for running multiple apps on shared servers. Then IT operations teams started to see how much this isolation could help them too. But virtualization changed a lot about how infrastructure was used and managed. Virtual machines were suddenly mobile. They were easily duplicated, easily scaled, and you could run a lot more of them on one box than you could before. That caused a lot of challenges, but it also created a huge market of opportunity because we had to rethink how we allocate and connected storage to VMs. We had to rethink how network resources were assigned, how they're shared, and, and how our approach to security had to change. So this is happening all over again with containers. Not too many enterprises have large-scale Docker deployments in production. The ones who do are typically using Docker for net new development or when they redesign an existing application, especially if they plan to deploy that app on an elastic cloud infrastructure. Uh, and that could be either public or private cloud. But that's going to change quickly. Once you've identified an app that's a good candidate for containers, you can start looking beyond just shorter development cycles 
and look to how containers can actually help you drive more efficiency in your data center deployments than you can get with virtual machines alone. That's really the next frontier, and I expect we're going to get there pretty quickly. Why launch an entire virtual machine with a complete operating system, which might take minutes, when you can launch a container in a running operating system, which might take seconds or even less? And that's where containers get interesting for the enterprise. And I think that's why we're seeing such a surge in new storage and networking technologies around containers. You see, it's easy to run a stateless application that only lives for seconds in a container. But if you're going to run a database workload, one that needs persistent storage, and that might need to share data with other containers, you need some powerful storage virtualization technology that's adapted for containers. Absolutely. Think about what we needed to make virtual machines highly portable, efficient, and secure. And then factor in the impact of a bunch of new, smaller, and maybe shorter-lived containers. There's really two ways to look at the impact. You can run containers inside a VM, and the big virtualization vendors are actively shrinking the footprint of their virtual machines to make that even easier. Uh, or you can run them on bare metal if you need that kind of performance. In the first case, you can inherit some of the storage and network control features of the virtual machine, but you still have a bunch of new processes vying for the same underlying infrastructure. In the second case on bare metal, you'll need to rethink how you present storage and networks to containers, how containers on a shared box will share, and especially how data is going to be persisted and managed. Think about what happened when VM consolidation ratios started going up, when we started running more VMs per box. And when we started doing new things like desktop virtualization, what we saw were crazy new I.O. requirements and new contention for storage and network resources that we didn't expect and were hard to predict. We saw random I.O. patterns, boot storms, and brittle network architectures that all made dynamic virtualization harder until we solved them with software-defined storage and software-defined networking. We're still solving those problems with new technologies every day, and containers are only going to make software-defined infrastructure more important. Basically, the more dynamic your application architecture is, the more you need software-defined control over all of the infrastructure that powers it. Today, most containers you have might just rely on simple overlay file systems. But it's only a matter of time before your developers are going to want containers that can provision their own storage replicate storage, snapshot it, all the advanced storage services that IT operations teams rely on to make virtual machines run so well. I'd recommend infrastructure and operations teams start by sitting down with their friends in application development to find out first how containers can help accelerate the software development lifecycle. Containers are a great way for development and test teams to cut some of the friction out of software delivery. You can have a developer define a container and pass it unchanged down through tests. No more doesn't work on my machine. Get involved early in the process because you want to be ready from a production standpoint when those apps are ready to actually be deployed in containers. Docker containers will also almost certainly open up new ways to boost your server efficiency. Do you need a full virtual machine for every app? Or does it take too long to launch an app with a full virtual machine? Consider a container. And another thing for infrastructure and operations teams, adopting containers can expand your deployment options, especially in the cloud. You'll be able to run a Dockerized app in nearly any cloud you want pretty soon, in addition to on your VMware or Microsoft or Red Hat virtualized infrastructure. But I would caution INO teams to pay attention to how the app is going to run, how long it needs to live, who it needs to talk to, and especially what kind of storage it needs. Since this market is evolving so rapidly, some vendor is probably already working on storage optimizations or container security or trusted networking. But you'll need to stay close to the vendors you trust to stay on top of that. Like any open source community, the Docker community is going to experience some growing pains. Keeping the players straight is going to take some investment on your part. But just like server virtualization a decade ago, the payoff is going to be well worth it.